Welcome back to the System Administration Miniconf for your entertainment and education. We have a double feature. Um, two talks from Arjun were both excellent, and so we accepted both of them and gave him half the time for each one. Um, we have Arjun talking about building his own border router and also a love story for WireGuard. Over to you, Arjun. Thank you, Ewan. And yeah, I've been asked to do the impossible. I'm going to try and do this. Um, there's not enough time for so much content. There's going to be lots of text on the screens and you're not going to be able to take it all in. However, the idea is that you'll be able to, you know, get the gist of it. And I will be posting um, the details on a GitHub repo that I haven't yet been able to fully sort out. The repo exists, but it's empty right now. So I promise it will be there. So first of all, background. Um, you may know me. I've got a bit of a database background. I'm no longer doing that at the moment. I'm actually chief security at Catalyst IT Australia. So I spend a lot of time in that realm. I'm also not a sysadmin. Um, I won't pretend to be. So some of this is hobbying. Um, you may well know things that I don't know. That's entirely likely. Um, and there may well be better ways of doing something, but there are often multiple ways. So I'll, I'll describe what, what I'm doing and why. So what are we trying to achieve? Um, a learning experience for me, um, sometimes doing something yourself is actually, you know, really useful to, to dig into things and, and get better grips. Um, a few tricks together sometimes cover an awful lot of scenarios. Um, looking about which bits work in practice for us, that doesn't mean that it works for other people, um, but also some things that other people say online don't necessarily work for us. So this is what works for me. And in part, it's also deployed at Catalyst. So there's no single this is right and something else is wrong. These are just a couple of ideas and I'm very, very happy to to take pull requests and, and other comments and questions. Um, and some things I don't understand myself, I just know they work. So, you know, if someone is able to provide the explanation, that would be great. So here we go. That is the inside of my of my router. Um, I actually have two and I'll, I'll prove the point. Its sibling is right here. It's a tiny little box. And the for the nerds here, the specs are right there. So it's a tiny little single board computer designed by Pascal Dernier in, in uh, Switzerland. It's a four core AMD, which is lovely. It has passive conductive cooling. It doesn't make any noise at all. Um, I have now added Wi-Fi to it since a couple of weeks ago. So you see that, that board. So the photo you see is my actual board that is currently running. Uh, what I showed you was its, um, its twin. So, um, and I also have a 120 gig um, mini PCI Express SATA in there. That is the, and let's see, I can actually go there. That is there on the screen. Um, so you can see that. And there's an awful lot of other ports that I just don't use at the moment. It's a very, very simple setup. Okay. But it does an awful lot. Oh, by the way, it's really, really cheap. It's kind of open hardware, open source software in the BIOS. It's pretty darn sleek. And it just works. Okay, what have I done with the software? Um, by the way, the, the hardware, you can look all that up on the PC Engine site. So it's no use for me actually spending more time on that. The case is also to be acquired there. You can, you can build your own case. You can do whatever you like. Um, okay, I'm running Debian 10 on it. Um, you could use Ubuntu, but Ubuntu doesn't by default, I think, like itself to be installed via a serial console where Debian 10 does. It doesn't require any hackery. You can just start with the plain USB stick. So that's pretty good. You could use Lux if you wanted to. And I used LVM with XD4. Um, I've now learned, and I'll mention that a bit later, that ButterFS might have been the better choice for some reasons I'll mention. Then I've used USB guard. I basically just installed it, which means, and, and set it to enforcing. That means that if anybody sticks in a USB keyboard or something else, they can't do anything because it won't actually get recognized by the kernel. It doesn't care anymore. I will not be covering RK Hunter and Suricata today because there just wasn't time. I will be put, putting it into the, uh, the GitHub repository because I do have some, some config there. 
There are a number of tools and packages you need to install. Bridge, bridge utils you will need, otherwise you will find that for odd reasons in your interfaces file, when you add a bridge, it doesn't actually work. Similar with VLAN. PPD is required if you have an ADSL or most NBN connections, and host APD is required if you want to set a, a wireless base station. I'm also not going into the Wi-Fi base station. Um, I don't yet have it working. Um, I appear to be somewhat incompetent with host APD. If someone is able to help me, that would be wonderful. Um, see it as a trade for the information I'm giving you today. That would be great. Um, IP tables, IP set. Um, that will be where we spend a lot of our time today. IP tables persistent. I'll be talking a bit about that because it will need a bit of tweakage. And I admit I moved from unbound to DNS mask. I advertised unbound and it turns out that DNS mask does something really cool. Um, that Unbound doesn't yet, um, so I'll, I'll be covering that. And of course, OpenSSH, MOSH, the, uh, the, um, the easier equivalent of that that actually survives suspending your laptop and coming back from a different location. Screen of him are my friends, and I will be covering WireGuard along the way. It will need a repo in Debian 10 to, um, to deal with, um, but in Ubuntu, you, you should actually have it included in 2004. It's, it's fairly straightforward, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter that it's not default. Okay, now, first of all, my disk layout. And so most of this is about security and, you know, trying to reduce the, well, people call it the attack surface, trying to, what I call it usually is reducing the noise, the amount of stuff that could happen that I need to keep an eye on. The less noise I have, um, the better anything funny will stick out, okay? So... I used LVM with multiple partitions, as I said, but I have since found out, and I'm using it elsewhere, that if you do ButterFS, you can actually use sub-volumes, and that is absolutely awesome. So you could do this in a single ButterFS volume, which means you don't have to muck around with multiple partitions and decide which partition is going to get how many gigabytes. It doesn't matter. In ButterFS, it can all, all be a single thing, and then the root, as well as all the other mounts, are separate sub-volumes, and then per sub volume, you can actually change the mounting options. You can't change all the options um, that you can put in FSTab, but anything that is not a ButterFS uh, option, you can set. So dev, no dev, um, no suid, no exec, those things, and read only, you can actually set. Okay, so all the partitions that don't need, all the mount points that don't need uh, devices, we've said no dev. Anything that doesn't need to it, we turn it off. And things that don't need to be executable, we turn it off as well. On a router, the home directories really don't need to be executable. Uh, the slash temp definitely doesn't need to be executable. Now, slash temp requires a tweak in APT uh, because by default, APT will actually go to temp for its packet installs. However, you can tell it to use slash var slash temp, and then all is well again. Okay, so you need to make slight tweaks there. Uh, slash user could be read only, and then what happens with APT, APT get when it installs things, it temporarily remounts it as read write and then mounts it back. As it turns out, that doesn't actually work in practice because I think because Various demons have things open there, and it's not clean, so it can't be unmounted, and therefore it never gets remounted. Um, it will make it rewrite, but it will never get it back to read only again. So it just doesn't matter. It, I think it's uh, it's good enough. Okay, and then have a swap file or a partition, um, whichever you want. Okay, on to interfaces. This uh, little router has four, I'll, I'll actually show it again here on the tiny screen you will see from me, it has four Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet ports, okay? So those are the ones we're playing with and that's aside from the Wi-Fi. I will set up one of these ports to be my internal network, so my LAN, and that is, that is um, NP1 is zero, okay? We're setting the MP to you to 9,000, jumbo frames are fine, that works perfectly, okay. Then the basic setup for the wireless is WLP 5S0, okay. We'll not cover that beyond that as I explained. Okay, then the bridging port. 
what I'm going to do is use two ports in my particular scenario. You can set it up differently. We're building a little switch. So first it turns out that if you try to set the MTU on the bridge port, it will make IP up fail. If I've up fail. Um, if someone knows where to put it so that jumbo frames might work, please let me know. I haven't been able to find it yet. Then a number of settings. Those commas aren't actually there. I just needed to fit it on the screen. Um, but what I'm doing is port two and three are bridged, okay? And then I bring them both up. So then I've got two ports that act as a as a little switch for me together with the uh, together with the the router with its firewall. Okay, so I still have full control over how that all communicates with each other. Then I have internode NBN via HFC cable. A joy it is. Um, I have to say it works much better since I actually use this router rather than either my older Debian box or the TP-Link from Internode. And I'll have more to say about that. So I need a VLAN. The VLAN 2 is required because Internet, Internode requires that. And for some odd reason, I also need a PPP connection. It's PPP over E using VLAN 2. And that is, it's actually all authenticated. And that is how that works. So this just works specifically for my home setup. And we're talking through it right now. This is what I'm talking through. Um, I said I might talk about in my talk per, um, proposal about rate limiting. As it turns out with this router, I don't need to. My NBN doesn't fall over anymore when I stuff a lot of data through it. That was a problem with the TP link. Um, if I stuffed a lot of data through it outbound, it would actually drop the connection. And Internode told me that it was something on the NBN end. As it turns out, it might not be. I actually now have 108 megabit downstream rather than 100. I'm quite pleased with that. Don't tell anyone. And I've got, you know, almost 50, uh, 40 megabit up. Um, and that works perfectly fine. I haven't been able to make it fall over. So running a good router apparently does a good job. Forget TP-Link because that's not a good router. Uh, what I did need to do is, and I'll show you here, the hardware address. Um, the hardware address of my router on the outside towards MBN does report itself to be the TP-Link router because, you know, that keeps people more happy with tech support. You know what I mean. Okay. Now, this file, we're delving into the kernel a bit. I won't cover this in detail, but there's a couple of things there. As it turns out, by default, the Linux kernel is not actually that well tuned as far as networking is concerned. There's a some number of things that are extremely slack and awkward, and they will not be able to deal necessarily with high traffic in an efficient way. If there's any kind of flood on your environment, you're going to be in trouble. So the first thing we need to do is give the kernel a bit of memory to play with, but also reduce a number of timers and counters so that they don't do um, nasty things. So in NetFilter, there's, you know, if there's an established connection before it gets, you know, taken out at, uh, for sleeping, half an hour. You might even may want to make that longer. All these, though, we set into 10 or 20 seconds. So that means at the end of a connection, when the connection gets closed, it will just wait 10 or 20 seconds before making it really, really disappear. And that makes things much nicer. That means there's fewer lingering connections in your netstat. Okay. This one is what I regard as a doozy. I haven't fully figured out what it does, but what it appears to do, by default it's set to on, it's weird. You know how at the start of a TCP connection, you have to send a SYN, that gets acknowledged, SYN ACK, and then another ACK gets sent, and then an ACK gets returned. And as it turns out, the kernel doesn't actually care for any of that. It's quite happy for you to just be talking or start talking skipping all those bits and netfilter will just a uh, contract will just pick up the connection as if it just magically was established of course this is a hideously bad idea when you're trying to run a router that gets rid of crap because this particularly will get abused by people producing crap so set it to zero we actually want a sin act handshake and you know it might take a couple of microseconds but who cares it's really not a problem all right Keep them going. Um, number of other timers and intervals and uh, thresholds. 
the IP filter equals two I've required in some cases for VPNs because packets that for a particular network go outbound via a particular port may not actually come back via the same port. This can happen if you run a VPN over your external port and things come back outside of the VPN. It could happen. If you don't have that problem, just set these settings to one. But if you find that you're not actually seeing your own data back, set it to two or make sure your VPN actually behaves. Okay. And secure redirects just means that um, ICMP redirect will work on your internal network, but only for published gateways within your network. And log all Martians, I love Martians, I just don't want to see them. Um, Martians are packets that come uh, in on the wrong interface. So it's an address that you that is known to your router, but it actually comes in on the wrong interface. You want to know about those because sometimes it can indicate a misconfiguration on your system. Um, and when they're logged, they ended up, end up in syslog as a Martian, and that is actually very useful. I actually spotted some last week, and that was very helpful for me to solve an issue. IP forward, make sure that the system knows where a router, that's quite important. Um, what I haven't mentioned yet, I'm not talking about IPv6 because lack of time. Some of it isn't set up yet on my end, um, but the basics are actually identical. Many of these things just get copied. So, what I'm now going to do is discuss some more settings. Again, this is the base, um, you know, the variable name, the configuration name inside the sysctl, and then after that will be the dot and so on with the rest of the parameters. So all of these parameters have the same baseline there. Um, so all of those things are there. So this is the idea. What we're trying to tune it a bit better now as I mentioned, some of these I don't actually know in detail what to do. Smart people than I have put these together in the information that I put on GitHub. I'll put full credits. It's just I didn't want to clutter the slides anymore. Um, if you have more information about any of these things, that would be awesome. If there's anything I can toss out, that would be fabulous too. Okay. More stuff. And I'll mention a couple of things along the way. There's information here. How many times, you know, when you receive a SYN from another server trying to open a TCP connection, we will send the SYN ACK back once. That's fine. By default, it will try to send it back a number of times because it's set to two or three by default or even five, I forget. The problem is that these things are spoofed. IP spoofing is used. So the SYN that you receive is often not actually sent by the IP address that it says it comes from. So you continuing to reply to it, asking it to continue and please set up the connection is useless. Okay. So we just set it to retry once. If it doesn't, if it, you know, if it doesn't work, tough luck. Usually our connections are good enough that it works the first time. All the spoofed ones will call, cost us less time. Same with thin retries. We only try to send twice outbound and, and just reduce the mess there. And otherwise we know there's a bad connection. We'd like to hear back. Timestamp equals zero gets rid of timestamp exposure on your external uh, connections. Um, if you want to set it for one, you might need that for, uh, for, um, for SYN proxy and some other things I'll mention. Um, I have it at zero usually just to, to keep my logs again clear in, in port scans. And again, a couple of timeouts reducing the mess. Okay, now this slide you don't have to take in, I don't either. However, the main point is IP tables and NetFilter are very, you could say complex, they're extensive. It does a lot and there's a lot of things happening in different places. I do love this diagram because it enables me to actually see visually, and I'm a visual person, see where things are happening. Why do I need to put things in a certain spot to make it work properly? And um, you know, keep it in the right place and make sure it actually does the right thing in all the right context. Um, and you can use this as a reference point when looking later at some of the bits I say, I need to do it here. This is the reason why, okay? Some things are not possible in all locations. So, yes, it's extensive. So Cloudfire has good, very good advice, you know, how to drop a million packets a second. They do that stuff. They do that stuff all the time. The tables that I'm going to be dealing with is the raw table, 
mangle table, filter table, and the net table, okay? Now, my rule is the less noise I let in, the less, uh, let in, the less noise I have to monitor. I want to be logging at first what I will be dropping. So I can look at it for a while, even if I'm dropping it, and then I know it's actually doing the right thing and I can take corrective action. Um, then after a while, I actually might stop logging certain things, again, to reduce the noise in my logs and make sure that the things that do show up are of interest to me. I regularly grab around in my syslog or elsewhere to, to see what I'm doing. There's a wonderful tool that Cloudfares Gang created called MM Watch. You're probably familiar with Watch already. You know, it, it runs a command every so many seconds and you can run it through a pipe and, and grab around in, in it and so on. So um, it actually gives you a nice, um, you know, status screen essentially. The MM Watch does the same thing. But specifically, it knows what the output of IP tables looks like. And it can actually display the counters. Uh, it can overlay the counters with a so many packets per second or so many bytes per second. So you can actually more, in more detail see what's going on. It's very slick and I, I like it. I don't have a screenshot of it right now. If you have time spare, I can show you live, but uh, chances are slim. Okay, Shin proxy or not, I'm not using it at the moment. What it does, is actually when you run a TCP connection, the router would actually proxy it towards any things on the, well, let's say on the local switch. So your router is actually sitting in between and then it creates a separate TCP connection internally uh, effectively. So that can reduce possible risk for your internal systems by the router sitting in between because it is slightly more control than your other systems possibly. Um, I didn't get very far with that. It didn't seem to be doing much for me. Um, you know, mileage may vary for you. Uh, maybe you have more information about it. We can uh, we can add more information to the to the GitHub repo there. So I won't go further into that. Okay, what do I do to do the logging? I have a couple of this set up in my IP tables. It's like this. They're not all like this. They're named differently. Um, M is for the mangle table. I have different naming for the different tables, pre for pre-routing, post for post-routing, forward for forward, and so on. Um, so when you see them later, I won't mention again that they're actually going to be logging and then dropping. When it says log drop, I mean this particular construct. And it will log, well, into syslog or wherever you want to be logging them. You can redirect that to other places because it comes from the kernel from IP tables. You can actually set it on, up to its own log if you want. It says, to, for me, I do have it in just straight syslog, IP tables, and then that command, uh, that prefix just like it has here. So I can tell where a particular drop packet was when it was dropped, where in IP tables that happened. And if you want to limit things, which I usually do, I limit it to, for instance, three per minute with a little bit of burst extra, okay? All righty. So the first thing we're doing is pre-routing in the mangled table. The mangle table is one of the first things that gets looked at, and pre-routing, again, is one of the first things that got looked at. And that means that it, it follows that rule of Cloudflare, where dropping things earlier is better, because IP tables can do very, very complex things, particularly when you get into contract and start chewing CPU power. Um, so the earlier you drop things, the, you don't have to worry about it. And that's why we're trying to keep the fewest possible connections, things needing to be tracked, and so on, um, so we don't need to deal with it like that. And here are a couple of my counters, and that shows you, is that particular setting actually having effect? So rather than doing a whole complicated thing, which you often see on you know, Stack Overflow and other places about um, which flags are set in my TCP packet, I've dropped all of that, and I only check for state invalid. Um, state invalid works fine, and see how many packets it actually drops. Um, so the first item is packet drop, the second item is a byte drop. So, you know, 25 megs of data have just been dropped and it's gone, okay? Then if it's a new connection, I want only the SYN flag to be set. Otherwise, again, I don't want to be talking to you because it's going to be something wacky that you shouldn't be doing. That I did. Weirdly sized packets that are much smaller or much larger than they need to be, I drop them. Related, I don't use it anymore because we don't have FTP and I have separate firewall rules for my SIP phone, okay? Um, 
related is a dangerous thing. Contract has all kind of wacky things, and you get things like uh, net slipstreaming um, effects because the kernel tries to figure out what connections might be related to others. And the answer from my end is none. Okay, so we just ditch that. So the one that I don't actually see, but I've just left it because it seems to be harmless, is dropping anything fragmented. There shouldn't be anything fragmented on my external um, interface, so I can just drop it without further looking at it. I'll talk more about the mblock bit, and outbound sanity is handled by that particular line. It just makes sure that when I send things back over my internode connection, it's actually clamped within the proper, the proper frame length so to not cause any trouble. And it does that when it opens a TCP connection, you know, at the SIN, SIN state there, at the SIN stage, sorry. Okay, so this is M block. And that's where it's, it's things, as far as I'm concerned, start getting interesting. So what I want to allow is, for instance, everything from um, Pingdom, because I do use Pingdom for some other historical reasons. And um, they provide a list of IP addresses that they will come from. It's not networks, it's actually a list of addresses and that works perfectly fine. So if this, if this block, uh, if this target actually returns, it allows something through and at the end you will see that everything else drops. Um, you can allow particular friendly IP addresses in your environment here. Um, I would be saying be more selective than that, but you know, this is a rough, idea to to tell you where where you can be heading with your uh, with this kind of setup and then i do some geo blocking so as it turns out many networks many countries produce a lot of noise and this is my home router i don't need to get inbound connections from country x it doesn't matter which one it is so um and that includes for instance the us the us is a very noisy country the number of things that have outbound connections to, to wherever it can be, trying things on, is just ridiculous. And then of course, there's the Russians, the Chinese and everyone else, but the basic fact is block them all and only allow the bits that you have in. I actually have a couple more countries set up historically to see what kind of traffic they produce and then I, and I drop them, but then it creates these counters. So um, in my earlier setup, I had the US and China and Russia, and you can just keep a nice eye on it. Um, where I get these block lists, I'll show you in a bit. Let's Encrypt is a bit of an issue. Let's Encrypt doesn't want to give a list of IP addresses, um, but I think what we should be able to do, particularly if we can work together on this, is a couple of autonomous networks um, that where these people come from, because inevitably they're going to come from a couple of different data centers at a couple of different providers, which means that they will have that... Uh, that facility, um, you know, that there won't be in that many different IP networks. We should be able to figure it out. A bit rougher than I'd like, but it will do. Um, full bogons. Um, bogons are invalid network ranges. So network ranges that are not actually allocated uh, on the internet, therefore no traffic can come from them. Might as well drop it. That's not gonna do anything good. Also, when you're seeing an external connection, 192.168 shouldn't actually appear on your external network. Okay, so you can drop that as well. And everything else, bye bye. And you see plenty bye bye. So this is all those other countries that are trying to send me stuff. And this is 216 megabytes. Just garbage. Okay, so you may have noticed IP set is our friend. These are the things I use to get my, my filter feeds. Some of those are lists of IP addresses, some of those are lists of networks. Okay, with subnets. So you either need to do hash IP or hash net. You create an IP set for that particular zone or country and set that up there. The family is INET or, or in um, INET 6, of course. Um, this timeout is 30 days and um, we'd like counters. And with counters, you don't have to do either of these. If you don't have the timeout, they'll stay forever but I let them time out and then every week, um, so the counter is 30 days, but every week I reload them. So the ones when an IP address drops out of a, a list, it vanishes within 30 days by itself. I don't have to do particular cleanup. That's just to make it life easier for me. The counters mean that 
the entries are individually counted. So either on IP address or subnet. And that means you can have a look at your IP set and see which ones actually get hit. If you want to track things specifically, if you want to map it on a on some, um, yeah, actually map it visually, that is all doable. So you can just read those into IP set. That is a bloody slow process. We can probably optimize that by writing a little script for it that, that does a kernel call rather than a, rather than IP set on the command line. This is not efficient. This takes, you know, 10, 15 minutes for a couple of lists, but it does work. All righty, this is my input table. Um, the default, first of all, is drop. And then there's a couple of things I accept. Things on the local net, on my local uh, interface I accept because some things happen there. Things on my local LAN interface I accept at the moment. Maybe I want to be a bit more careful with that because, you know, my kids have a couple of window machines on that network. I do have them segregated, but maybe I want to be a bit more careful there that they can't just connect to everything else. Um, and they shouldn't be able to connect between them as well, I would think. Um, so, you know, further restrictions are possible. I could, I've got a fairly smart switch. I could make sure that that switch doesn't actually allow communication between the systems. They only allow that via the router, it's possible. And then I accept anything that's already established. Again, I'm not allowing here, I'm not allowing related connections. I'm only allowing established connections. I'm allowing SSH and MOSH, this is, these are the MOSH ports, um, from the local network but they're also allowed from the VPN connections. So what I've done is I've changed the interfacing to basically say anything that is not from the public internet, I'm allowing. Perhaps not as restrictive as it should be, but you get the idea. So what can we do with pings? Well, pings can actually cause a lot of blah, they create a lot of noise. These, I understand, are an actual ping package. They're pings and ping responses and a couple of notifications. Those are the ones you actually should be letting through um, they're useful. There's nothing wrong with ping in that sense, but you shouldn't be letting through other stuff. You can just drop it there. You can stuff, stuff an awful lot of junk in there. Potentially people can actually exfiltrate data through ping um, by ju just stuffing, uh, stuffing those packets. So, you know, inbound, why not just drop those things? Then general rule set that I would use for hosts, but on this system, of course, it, done, it, can, it could potentially run some services as well. It doesn't for external purposes. Um, so on the host internal on that switch that I run, they use these rules. They have a, um, a essentially a rate limiting trick. Um, they reduce the number of inbound connections and they, they don't need to connect that many things, but I don't have easy servers on that thing. Um, if you do, you might need to set these to be different, obviously. So there's some forward rules also in the filter table. And again, my default is drop. So anything that is not mentioned here will get dropped on the floor. The local LAN is accepted, provided the originating address is as I want it to be. Uh, other friendly IPs, I will definitely forward for you. Um, anything established, I will forward already. And I will forward pings as well. So things from our internal network going out or from the outgoing network going in, I will let through if they're of the right variety. So similar to before, that was local. This is um, for forwarding. Then more restrictive towards my switch and the internal network, but you know, mainly the switch. If uh, something comes from the external interface and is a new uh, connection, and it's for one of these ports, and you will see this is a mail server in this case, then I will do some connection limiting. And what it does here, it masks it with 24 bits. That means I, I have a maximum of 20 uh, of 16 million entries. We can easily handle that. Should people from different, uh, lots of different IP addresses within the same network try to connect to my mail server at some point, they will get limited. Well, tough luck. I don't receive that many mail, uh, that much mail there. Um, you know, this is a regular web server. And again, this is an ex the uh, further example of the um, of a mail server. OK, so this one is specifically drop if it's if it's above that limit and this one accepts, but only if it's to that port. So those two steps are from my mail server. Next, DNS mask, as I mentioned, instead of using um, what is it? Unbound. I love unbound. It's awesome. So much nicer than bind. 
um, nicer to set up, nicer to configure, so many fewer security issues. It makes me much happier. I've used it for a number of years now. However, this particular router uses DNS mask, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, but most of these things you can also do with Unbound. So in the case of DNS mask, I don't use it as a full recursive resolver. It doesn't do that. Unbound does that. What I do at the moment is I point it at Cloudflare's DNS. You could use 1111 or 1112 for the extra, extra uh, malware filtering. Uh, 1113, you can actually make things um, safer for, um, for, um, for families. OK, then I have um, ad servers and bad servers that I'm filtering that I feed off these feeds. OK, I see I need to speed up a bit because I'm running out of time, as expected. Um, I'm letting through some information for from the low um, so that the DNS mask can actually work. Yeah. Um, again, I'm trying to be really, really restrictive there. Now, this is one you might like. I can actually create an IP set in DNS mask and only allow things through in my firewall if that IP address has previously been looked up by DNS, which means that outbound, nothing will get through unless it's been looked up in DNS. This may seem really weird, but it works. It is so much better than, for instance, TLS inspection or whatever, in my opinion, because I don't have to worry about weird people, you know, people doing weird things like tunneling through um, DNS over HTTPS. I don't care. If you're trying to get out of my realm without looking at DNS first, it will not work. It's as simple as that. If you're a gamer, you may need to set up some things extra. So this is a really cool one, and it seems to actually get rid of a lot of malware, people doing weird things. Um, Apple devices seem to do a lot of weird things directly to IP addresses, but blocking it doesn't seem to hinder my kids. So I've just dropped it. OK, now WireGuard. And um, this needs a bit of time, obviously. I've got eight minutes left. Should be all right. OK, it's tiny. It's a few thousand lines of code. It's secure, so far at least. And it's been looked at you know, substantially over the last couple of years. It's pretty fast. Some people say it's faster than something else, but that depends on how you use it and on what platform. So I won't say it's faster than anything else, but it's fast enough and it works fine. It's UDP based and it can encapsulate anything in there. It's easy to set up as well as very, very powerful. I love it, which is why I called it Why I Got a Love Story. I'm, I have used and still use OpenVPN. Um, we also use corporately OpenVPN as well as IPsec. I really, really like WireGuard. It's so much easier to manage. And when something is easy to manage, there's less chance of making mistakes. And that's a really, really good thing. It's in the latest kernel, 5.6 kernel. In Ubuntu, it's been backported to 5.4. These are the kernel modules that you end up with when you load it, or at least on my system. I just did that yesterday to give you a bit of an idea. So those are the protocols that are used. It uses Curve 25519 and so on, OK? So it uses, you know, the latest in what we regard as decent decent crypto and related stuff. This is the config. And every time I should put complete at the top of the, line of the page, this is my complete config. I didn't strip it. This is the entire config for my, um, for my VPN stuff. So this is the VPN server. I set some stuff, which you see on the left-hand side, for the server, including its private key, which sadly wrapped. I'll fix that later. And then for my roaming laptop, I need to tell um, my server, what the peer public key address is, and what the um, what its public uh, what what its private network address is within my um, within my um, address range that I use. I can also run a VPN host uh, with another country, and I'll use that for geo routing in a bit, and I'll show you that as well. Of course, I've got both of those working. So this is my roaming laptop. You saw how easy the server was. This is how my laptop now operates. My, my laptop is now always on WireGuard. It doesn't matter whether it's on the LAN, on Wi-Fi, a wired connection, or whether I walk out and go on someone else's Wi-Fi or my mobile phone, uh, you know, mobile uh, roaming. Um, it will always be on WireGuard. And that means that you're no longer for some traffic running on your local network. And that can make things quite a bit safer. So if you set up your wire, um, 
the IP tables on your laptop appropriately, you can actually make sure that that laptop is fairly well insulated from whatever network it's on, as well as just only talking via your wire guard. And then all your traffic is neatly encrypted and it, it won't leak elsewhere. There's no split tunneling involved there. So I quite like that idea. We're looking at doing this corporately. We haven't set it up yet. We'll be doing some experiments fairly shortly. And yeah, obviously you can also set your, your resolver, your DNS resolver to run across the VPN server rather than doing that locally. Again, you know, it can reduce possible problems, people interfering with your DNS or, or looking at it. Uh, they have no business looking at it. So you can, uh, you can hide that away. You just need to make sure it stays on, but it seems to be uh, working fairly well with me so far. I, I haven't had trouble that leaving it rather than uh, scripting around it. So VPN host in another country. So in my case, I do this to the Netherlands, but you know, you can do it to anywhere you like. This again is the entire setup. And you can see that WireGuard can have, when you bring the interface up, it can do something particularly to set up the routing for you and the other way around. So that's all you need there. What I then need to do in my main server is a bit more finicky and mileage here varies. This tends to work most of the time. I found that going through some services, some of the servers are not actually technically in that country. Um, so you might need to add some extra IP addresses rather than just the IP addresses that belong with that country. Again, well, maybe we can share some, some insights there in the, um, in the GitHub repo. Um, so we're doing policy-based routing. So based on matching my country list, which again is one of those, um, those IP lists that I've picked up, I actually set a marker in, um, on the packet. And that allows me to do policy-based routing. It allows me to do routing based on a flag being set. I first have to exclude the public address of my own server in the Netherlands, because otherwise it would start doing funny things and not actually work. Um, and obviously I have to let WireGuard port through. This is the stupid way you can make it better, of course, but you get the idea. You have to allow some things. This is roughly what you need to do. And in some cases it is already what WireGuard does for you automatically, um, cause it's getting rather smart about these things. If, um, so you're adding that, um, that address to the WireGuard interface, if you haven't already, it should be, um, and then this priority routing, it, uh, first of all, we're adding a table that has a name, and that is a routing table with a name, which has its own default address. So that's the, the, the private address that I'm using on the WireGuard interface. Um, and then I'm saying that anything that has this marking needs to go to that particular table. So that's how I'm doing policy-based routing. Again, it's a really quick explanation. Maybe I'm being a bit not optimal in my explanation, but that gives you a basic idea of how that works. And it seems to do the job. I can actually, you know, just switch it on and it will automatically, anything that needs to go in my case to the Netherlands will go via that and nothing else. So that, that does the job. All right, I think I made it with two minutes spare. Would you believe? I'm happy to take some questions, but you have 30 seconds delay on me. So I'm just, it might just be better to have the, uh, the questions in, in chat and via email and in the GitHub repository. And I promise I will post everything there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that talk, Arjun. I am really impressed you managed to fit it all in and came in under time. Um, I do think given that we're about to go into a break, it would be best to do questions in the Venulus text chat. Um, yep. So if you're happy to pop over there, um, there's definitely been some good discussion going on and um, some questions posted there for you. And okay, awesome. Of the slides, we will put them up on the website and that will give people details that they can refer to as well. All Thank right. you. Thank you for your talk. Um, we have a 25 minute meal break now. Um, pick the meal that it is based on your time zone and we will see you in 25 minutes for our last set of talks.